by the way, we got from Herb Cross, who was over in the neighborhood of the 49er bench, was that he had a cramp and possibly could be back. Second down and 10. Eisman looks right, now looks left, goes deep. Incomplete. Flag is down. Penalty marker down. Art Monk back with Eric Wright. Not much doubt about that one. The Walsh is saying we didn't need that. Whew. The toughest penalty in the National Football League is pass interference. That's the longest one. Now watch Eric Wright. He's number 21. Going against Art Monk. The ball's in the air. You can't touch him. Look to see. It looked like he was pushing with that left hand on him. Only seven yards on the penalty. Let's watch him left on. You see the left arm on him right there? See him push there? That's pretty close. He's not. It'll probably be a pass. He's not. He is not. It's Washington. Mark Mosley over on the sideline. This guy's been back and quickly he goes in the corner. Knocked away at the last second intended for Alvin Garrett. Knocked away by Collier. I flag, see a flag down. Flag down. Going to be against the 49ers. Holding number 42 defense. Automatic first down. Automatic first down. Ronnie Locke. Really upset. Oh, Ronnie Lott was on Charlie Brown. Let's see if we can see it right here. Here's Charlie Brown, 87. Ronnie Lott, 42. He can chuck him the first five yards. That's okay. Left it. Oh, he called it right there. You see Lott look over there? He knew right away when he had that left hand up there that he was calling for holding. Boy, these, these officials are getting pretty tight here in this fourth quarter. Okay. It was the worst call in NFL history because never in a championship game has there ever been more of an obvious blown call in the history of football. Dean, by the way, we got from Herb Cross, who was over the bench, was that he had a cramp and possibly could be back. Second down and 10. Eisman looks right, now looks left, goes deep. Incomplete. Flag is down. Penalty marker down. Art Punk back with Eric Wright. Not much doubt about that one. Walsh is saying we didn't need that. Whew. The toughest penalty in the National Football League is pass interference. That's the longest one. Now watch Eric Wright. He's number 21. Going against Art Monk. The ball's in the air. You can't touch him. Let's to see. It looks like he was pushing with that left hand on him. Only seven yards on the penalty. Let's watch him left on. You see the left arm on him right there? See him push there? That's pretty close. Yep. First down, Redskins. They give to Riggins. Riggins trying to get around the corner. Popped out of bounds by Dwayne Gore. Stops the clock with 2.08 remaining. Certainly they're in field goal range, but it's been a horrible day for Mosley. 
we can see that interference call again and see if we can see the left arm there because the right arm's okay so it'd have to be that left arm or hand with a push in there because that wasn't it right there at the end that's okay the rule says interference can be called only if the ball is catchable, Wright argued. There's no way he could have caught that ball. I pushed him, but it was after the ball was way overthrown. That ball could not have been caught by a 10-foot Boston Celtic, 49ers coach Bill Walsh said, of the play. Mark Mosley over on the sideline. This side's been back and quickly he goes in the corner. Knocked away at the last second intended for Alvin Garrett. Knocked away by Collier. I flag, see a flag down. Flag down. Going to be against the 49ers. Holding number 42 defense. Automatic first down. Automatic first down. Ronnie Lott. Two plays fetched five yards. The next, the 49ers, the next one had the 49ers even more outraged. On third and five from the 13, cornerback Ronnie Lott was called for holding on what seemed to be a harmless bit of waltzing with Brown, far from where the pass fell incomplete. Charlie and I had quit on the ball, Lott said. We were both watching to see if the pass would be complete. You just don't expect those kinds of calls in a playoff game. Really upset. Oh, Ronnie Lott was on Charlie Brown. Let's see if we can see it right here. Here's Charlie Brown, 87. Ronnie Lott, 42. He can chuck him the first five yards. That's okay. Left it. Oh, he called it right there. You see Lott look over there? He knew right away when he had that left hand up there that he was calling for holding. Boy, these, these officials are getting pretty tight here in this fourth quarter. You want to lay a challenge down to somebody like me? You better make darn sure that that mouth that you're writing the check with, you better make sure you have the funds to cash that check. So to all you Saint fans out there, what you just saw was something just as bad as what you went through. And I'm going to dissect it. I'm not a 49er fan. No question about it. I hate the Niners. But you know what? On the pass interference penalty that was called, the ball landed and you saw it on the first clip. Heck, I saw it live. Two and a half yards out of bounds and to the left while Art Monk was stumbling and fumbling, reaching for the football. He couldn't have caught that ball if he was Jerry Rice in his prime. Okay, and Art Monk's a Hall of Fame wide receiver. That wasn't pass interference. That ball was so beyond catchable, it wasn't even funny. And the defensive holding, later on on that very same drive? Come on, man. That's not holding today, let alone back then when the rules were a little more laxed. So you have two instances under two minutes to go that determined who went to the Super Bowl. It was the Redskins and the 49ers and the officials made some bad calls and the Redskins went on to the Super Bowl. Now a little background on this game. Just so you know, the Redskins got out to a 21-0 lead. Hmm, sounds familiar. They blew it. The 49ers came roaring back, despite bad calls all game long, both ways, mind you, unlike last week or unlike this Sunday. Um, and yet, they still managed to complete and tie the game. Then, on what was the Redskins' final drive of the game, you saw how it was two penalties, and then they kicked the game-winning field goal to go up 24-21. The Niners, like the Saints, had one more opportunity to win the game when it was top, at the end of the game. They had less time. They had no timeouts. And like the Saints, their quarterback, who's going to be a Hall of Famer eventually, and Joe Montana, he is a Hall of Famer, like Drew Brees, who's going to be a Hall of Famer, threw a pick at the end of the game. Difference is, the Redskins then didn't need to drive up the field and win it. They already had the game won. So, for five seconds, can we please stop pretending like this is the most egregious thing we've ever seen in football history? The tuck rule was much worse than what you all went through, boys. I hate to break it to you. That was a fumble. They reinvented the rule 
to ensure the Patriots keep the football, keep that in mind. They went to replay on the tuck rule. They went to replay. Clearly a fumble. Still didn't want to rule it that way. Changed the definition of the rule to keep the Patriots with the football. Do you understand how much worse that is than what you just went through? Boom call. I agree. Didn't go to replay. They didn't reinvent the definition of the rule to keep your team from going to the Super Bowl. They did the Raiders. So I don't want to hear it. I'll tell you why I feel good about this win. When we cover the Ram game. But you had opportunities after the mistake by the official. The blown call. Whatever you want to call it. And you still didn't do it. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news. There ain't no guarantees in life. How do you know Aaron Donald and Adamic and Sue don't make a game-changing play later on? I'm going to talk about that later too. But since the challenge was made, let's dissect this, shall we? Because I think it bears fruit for what we're talking about. In the neighborhood of the 49er bench was that he had a cramp. First things first, you're going to notice on this drive, there's 2 minutes and 28 seconds to go, and the 49ers, like the Rams, only have two timeouts. Okay? So I want you to keep that in mind. There's two timeouts, and there's 2.28 to play when the madness begins. And possibly could be back. Second down and 10. Eisman looks right, now looks left, goes deep. Incomplete. Flag is down. Penalty marker down. Art Monk back with Eric Wright. So as I said earlier, Art Monk is running down the sideline for the football. Okay? It lands, as you saw, the indention of the dirt. Thank God for grass and not artificial turf back in those days because you might not have seen it. Nowadays, we have the rubberized pellets that would have come up. But nonetheless, it's the same effect. You see it land out of bounds, out of bounds. Two yards, two, two, two yards out of bounds. Okay? Now, for you to understand what he's going to have to do to reach across the field, six feet, catch the football and toe tap, back then, okay, you could force out. There's no question, right? And that still would have been a completion. But... That's going to be an extremely difficult catch, especially when you see the way Art Monk is stumbling and fumbling and falling down the field. I cannot even believe I'm defending the 49ers here, but I'm making a point on behalf of the Los Angeles Rams. And to calm you Saint fans down a little bit that are absolutely losing your mind like a petulant child who didn't get the candy bar at the grocery store and now you're throwing a temper tantrum and making everybody's life miserable because you feel like you've been wronged because you were good in preschool and you deserve the lollipop. Not much doubt about that one. The Walsh is saying we didn't need that. Whew. The toughest penalty in the National Football League is pass interference. That's the longest one. Now watch Eric Wright, he's number 21, going against Art Monk. The ball's in the air, you can't touch him. Tough to see, it looks like he was pushing with that left hand on him. So on the replay, you're going to notice originally they thought, oh, it was clearly a call, right? Now you're thinking, well, Anthony, there's a difference between the Saints and Rams. That was bang, bang. This one wasn't. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. It absolutely wasn't. Certainly wasn't to the 49ers, and it certainly wasn't to 49er fans, and it certainly wasn't to this Ram fan who hates the 49ers. First time you saw that play, you knew that ball was uncatchable. All right? And you notice Summerall starts to change his mind on... The call, keep in mind Summerall's an old man, okay, he's up in the stands, he's far away, he's looking at a small teleprompter, there is no HDTV, they don't have 97,452 angles to see the hit from, and it's not in high def. It's pixelated old school television color screens from 1983. So, it might not have been as obvious initially because of the equipment, but as he started looking at it, even Joe Ma even even John Madden was like, Maybe he pushed him there at the end with his left hand. 
I agree, John. He did. There's one problem when he pushed with his left hand, and you'll see it again on the next replay. That's the third one we're going to look at, okay? And that is ball's overthrown. It's out of reach. It's uncatchable. Like the Saints, this was a second and 10 call that went in favor of one team and didn't benefit another team, and it was a very bad call. Take a look at the third replay, which we're going to show, because there's something else I'm going to point out. You tell me if this ball is catchable. 27 yards on the penalty. Let's watch it left on. You see the left arm on him right there? He push it. That's pretty close. Yep. Right. Now notice John Madden and Pat Summerall, the more they're looking at the penalty, okay, and John Madden wasn't convinced it was pass interference from the beginning. You, you could tell that. But the more he's starting to look at it, he's trying to figure out what in the heck the official saw. Mind you, the official that threw the flag is on the sideline with the perfect vantage point of the play. He's got the best angle, better than any TV angle you get. He's still going to throw that flag? He's still going to throw that flag. The official, fun fact, later on admitted that it was the push-off at the end that did it. Really? Take a look at this final replay and listen very carefully to John Madden. Let's see if we can see that interference call again. See if we can see the left arm there. Because the right arm's okay, so it'd have to be that left arm or hand with a push in there. Because that wasn't it right there at the end. That's okay at the end. That's not it at the end. That's okay at the end. And that's exactly what the official said made the penalty for him was the end. The clear push off at the end. The clear push off at the end? You mean the one that didn't exist? See, Saint fans, you have a complaint over one call. You want to talk about the worst two minutes in the history of professional football in a championship weekend? Why don't we take a look at this? Later in the drive, with two minutes to go, the Redskins are looking at a pretty dire situation. Their kicker's missed four field goals already. He's not had a good day. In fact, he's missed two from similar distance where they're at. Then they're going to make another call that's going to hurt the 49ers and benefit the Redskins. Take a look. Two minutes left to play. Third and five at the 13 for Washington. I think the key here is if Riggins is in, it'll probably be a run. If he's not, it'll probably be a pass. He's not. He is not. It's Washington. Mark Mosley over on the sideline. This has been back and quickly he goes in the corner. Knocked away at the last second intended for Alvin Garrett. Knocked away by Collier. I flag, see a flag down. Flag down. Going to be against the 49ers. Holding number 42 defense. Automatic first down. Automatic first down. Ronnie Locke. Really upset. Oh, Ronnie Locke was on Charlie Brown. Let's see if we can see it right here. Here's Charlie Brown, 87. Ronnie Locke, 42. He can chuck him the first five yards. That's okay. Left to, oh, he called it right there. You see Lott look over there? He knew right away when he had that left hand up there that he was calling for holding. Boy, these, these officials That's, are getting pretty tight here oh, in this man. fourth quarter. At this point, John Madden can't believe that the, that the officials are going to make a second bad call on the very same drive. So he's trying to justify something. What you actually saw was Ronnie Lott looking at the ball being thrown completely out of bounds, or not completely out of bounds, but towards Charlie, you know, towards um, the, the Redskins wide receiver in the corner of the end zone. He's watching the flight of the ball, right? Now his hand is out. Now under the rules back then, that's not holding. <clears throat> that's not holding by a long shot, especially since his arm was locked. And you don't see it, but the guy's holding his arm. Okay? Again, you can make a case here, Saint fans. Well, that's not as obvious is the one against us in the Superdome. No, not initially. But again, the guy that throws the flag is in the back of the end zone 
looking at Ronnie Lott. If he's watching Ronnie Lott and he sees the receiver holding Ronnie Lott's arm and the ball is nowhere near the field of play, and back then they got holding right, by the way, okay? It wasn't holding unless the quarterback was either looking in that direction or going in that direction. A little bit harder to interpret, but most officials kind of looked at it like, look, if he's going to throw to the corner of the end zone, he's not going to throw to the seven-yard line. So we'll go ahead and count it. Now this official's excuse was, well, he was looking in that direction, which was under the interpretation of the law. But there's no, or rule, but there's no question, there's no hold there. There's no locking of the arm. It's extended, but there's no grip or pull or tug or push. And back then, that was key language in the rule. Not today, but back then. And you're going to see as this film progresses, more and more, they're starting to realize, well, that's a garbage call too. Even Joe, Mo even John Madden, I keep saying Joe Montana, even John Madden at the end was like, boy, they're really, they're really calling it tight now here late in the fourth quarter. In other words, John didn't buy the bull crap either. That's it when you see it right here. Here's Charlie Brown, 87. Ronnie Lott, 42. He can chuck him the first five yards. That's okay. Left to, oh, he called it right there. You see Lott look over there? He knew right away when he had that left hand up there that he was calling for holding. Boy, these, these officials are getting pretty tight here in this oh, fourth quarter. Understand the magnitude of what's going on here, okay? Try to put your bias as a Saint fan aside and notice the similarities here for your football team, okay? And I'm going to get to a point here in a minute, but I'm, I'm showing you this in great detail so you get it. You're going to see the replay again. They're going to show it again later on, and they're going to talk about it. And even they're starting to question here because under the way the rule was written for holding, there's got to be a grab and a tug. It's the same on offense. There's no tug. There's no grab. And Madden's going to mention it. Here it is. Let's watch the second of the two. Now, Ronnie Lott can chug in there. He can chug in that area, that five yards. I don't know. That's awfully close to be calling out a hole. He was looking, looking out. His left arm went outside there. That's a very tight call. Here's the first one earlier. Now watch Eric Wright's left hand. He pushes Art Monk right at the end there, and that's that's the pass interference. So those two penalties were the biggest part of that drive for the Redskins. Those two plays were the biggest part of the drive for the Washington Redskins. They kicked a field goal. Guys, again, understand this game, okay? You need to watch it. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube, all right? Maybe I'll do a separate post with just this game but I'll probably get flagged by YouTube for doing it. But the bottom line is in this game, the 49ers were roaring back down 21. They had just tied the game at 21 when the Redskins took over on that final drive. The Redskins had zero momentum. The 49ers had all of the momentum. They were down 21 and just tied the game. And as John Madden put it, that Redskin drive was two penalties were the key on that drive. Now, as a 49er player, that's the worst thing you can hear. Sounds a lot like Mike Thomas, right? The officials determine the outcome of the game. Don't like it. Don't appreciate it. But it is what it is. It sucks. But I promise you, Saint fans, there's been worse calls in NFL history. You're watching one. Let's take a look at the penalties again. Eyes the clock. Here's the first controversial play. This was pass interference on Eric Wright against Art Munt, and it had to be right there, that left hand pushing Munt right there in the middle. Now that was the big one. That got him down there. Then on a third down play. Here it is, third down. If they stop him now, one, they may still kick the field goal, but if they don't, they're going to have more time than they had. Holding on Ronnie Lott. That's awfully picky to me. We've dissected both of these plays, and they were clear misses. They were absolute bogus calls that should not have gone the way of the Washington Redskins. Kind of nice, though. It is my favorite team and my second favorite team that benefited from this many, many years apart. But as a Ram fan, I can tell you that I've been on the other end. I've been on the end that the New Orleans Saints are having to deal with right now. Oh, I don't know, for about 20-something years plus. Over my lifetime?
Usually, guys, the calls don't go our way. I'm very thankful. Finally, finally, we got something to go our way. Because I seem to remember week nine and an obvious call that was blown that gave you home field advantage. Oh, but we don't want to go there. But what the 49ers did, what the 49ers fans did, as opposed to what you're doing, couldn't be more different. See, the 49er fans, they threw a parade for their team when they came home. They celebrated as if they won the championship game. The 49ers took this loss and used it as a galvanizing moment, geared themselves ready because they had pretty much the same team returning. Should sound familiar like y'all down there in the bayou. And they went 15-1, and one, greatest record in NFL history at that point. The Bears would tie it. Well, NFC record. No NFC team had ever won that many games um, until the Bears tied it the following year. They go 15-1. and one. They go 23 nothing over Chicago in the championship game. They beat the Giants, and they beat the Dolphins with their high-scoring offense in Dan Marino. Okay? It was the best 49er team next to the 89 Niners in the decade, and I would argue they were a little bit better because they were driven by something meaningful to them. The memory of the 83 championship game. You guys in New Orleans should be upset. You should be angry. I know I was. We're going to fast forward here. We're going to rewind the clock to 2000. 18 years ago. Actually, yeah, 18 years ago because it was 2001 in January. My Rams, they're in Louisiana. It's a seven, I think seven, seven ball game. Toss to Marshall Folk, down block, Ronald Willi uh, Roland Williams, kick out block by the wide receiver. Marshall Folk splits the seam and goes 80 yards or 78 yards for the touchdown. Rams go up 14 to 7. They called holding. It's known as the phantom holding penalty. Cost the Rams the NFC wildcard game and a chance to go to the divisional playoff game. Now, before you say anything, everyone widely thought that team was good enough to win the Super Bowl, and they were, much like your football team. So don't tell me, well, it's the championship game. That was the wild card game. doesn't matter because my team would have won the Super Bowl that year. There's no question about it. We were the defending NFL champions, and we got taken on a bogus penalty early in the game, and it completely ruined the game. We ended up losing that game by three points. Remember, I said Marshall Falk scored the touchdown. So we would have been up four when Ozaki muffed the fumble, muffed the punt return if the dynamics of the game even unfold that way. No. What do you... So what did I do? I'll tell you what I did. My dad came in. <laughs> Anthony, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm not. Because I know next year the Rams are going to absolutely wreck the NFL and they're winning the Super Bowl, Dad. That's what I told him. Wasn't worried about it. Turned off the TV. Went about my day. Bad call the entire game. The refs were stacked against us. There was no question about it. Every call went New Orleans' way. I didn't protest. And I certainly, under no circumstances, turned around and whined about it 48, 72 hours later. And now you guys are trying to get a lawsuit against the NFL as season ticket holders to replay the game with 149 to go and the first and goal? You should be ashamed of yourself. You should be ashamed of yourself that you genuinely believe you are so entitled over every other team in NFL history that you deserve something no other organization in sports, forget football, in professional sports has ever gotten. 1985, Kansas City Royals against the St. Louis Cardinals. The worst call in World Series history. It cost St. Louis the World Series. I didn't see St. Louis protesting Major League Baseball to replay the game as if he got the base hit or the out, I should say, whatever it was. 
So you guys are really embarrassing yourselves. And I hope you understand you're becoming the laughing stock of the National Football League. Right now, Falcon fans everywhere are loving this. Because you're melting down like a snowflake in college that somebody said something you mildly disagreed with and you're losing your chocolates. That's how you're acting. See, it's a blown call. I acknowledge. Now, Eric is going to talk here in a little bit. He's going to call in. And we're going to talk about this penalty, about this game. Now that I've given you an education, NFL pundits, that yes, there has been worse calls in NFL history in a conference championship game that were just as damaging to the, to the losing team as what happened in Louisiana. And hopefully you Saint fans have a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of somber or a little bit of, of, of reality going, okay, this is, we're not the only ones this has happened to. Hopefully. Now, when Eric calls, we're going to get into some weeds about this penalty. And then we're going to go into the games. See, I'm covering all of this in one show. This is going to be like a mega blowout show, right? This is just going to be like, you guys could probably run this Saturday for a good couple hours. Share it with your friends, take stin bits, do what you want with it. Eric's calling in a minute. But remember, this isn't the worst that's ever happened in NFL history. I would argue Raider fans have a bigger gripe than even the 49er fans. And I would argue Ram fans have an even bigger gripe. I'll get to that later. All right. So I promised Eric that I wasn't going to go into a whole bunch about the penalty or penalties. I was going to let Eric do that. So I'm Anthony. I'm Eric. And uh, Rams are going to the show, bro. Well, you know, the sun shines on a dog. Never mind. Um, no, it's definitely, uh, definitely, definitely heartfelt congratulations. I mean, you know, not only did you have to play in New Orleans and against the Rams, but also against the referees, who ended up being, you know, on your payroll. So I'm kidding. Uh, no, it was a good win. Rams, uh, Rams won the Super Bowl. Really thought they were going to play somebody different, but, you know, Anthony got what he wished for. So be careful what you wish for. You would, text me, you would text me that during the game, bro. You would text me that during the game. So I sent you yep. a couple of pictures. Because um, we're going to get into. Yeah, sorry, I, I texted you that during the. Patriots game, not the Rams game. No, you did. You did. And and we were competing against the Saints and the Superdome, not the Rams. But you know what they say, if you can't beat them, if you can't beat them, Eric, pay them. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Too soon? All right. Look, all kidding aside, um, I want to get into the penalty and get this over with so we can actually go into some analysis because this these two games, contrary to what people want to pretend – were the it, this was the best championship game weekend in NFL history. Um, now it was marred a little bit by penalty, but never before had both championships gone into overtime, which I don't think can be understated. Now, getting into this, I sent you two pictures. The first one clearly shows Drew Brees has not gotten the football even snapped, and there's zero seconds on the clock, and that was on the touchdown um, pass that the Saints then went up thirteen nothing on. I have the image. We're going to show that here in a minute. The second image that you're going to look at, um, that you're going to see, is a clear face masking penalty on Jared Goff, which had occurred on the Rams' first drive when they ended up kicking a field goal instead of getting a touchdown. He was short of the first down. The face mask was obvious in the first quarter. They didn't call it. It was blatant. It was obvious when you were watching it live, and that ended up coming back and biting the Rams. So, I'm going to go ahead and let you take a look at those two images, and then when we come back, Eric's going to talk about them. I do agree with him, by the way, on the delay of game penalty, because I kind of already know what Eric's going to say on that, and I just want to say that I agree. So take a look at the shot. All right, well, as you can see, what looks like a delay of game penalty 
the clock on the TV and the official clock, and that doesn't include the uh, game clock uh, in the stadium, which I would think would be official, but the referees whole, uh, have have both clocks uh, basically on their wrists to, to see like the time and hold the official uh, hold the official time. Um, so I've seen that happen numerous times. It just didn't happen, you know, first and foremost in this game. Um, do I agree with it? No. But a referee has to look at the ball, look at the clock, look at the ball. If that ball is a snap, he'll throw the flag. And if it is snapped, he'll let it go. And, you know, some some quarterbacks are really good at getting it off at the very, very last second. Breeze is one of them. Rodgers is another. Should have been a penalty? Probably, but where was the referee looking at the time? And there is a, a, there's what, 11 on the field? Can't anyone throw, anyone throw the flag on that? Yeah. No, they can. Okay, so, I mean, there's there's at least 11 officials on the field, so somebody throw the flag. It, 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 if, if it's deemed that it's, if it's deemed that it's um, a delayed game. I mean, you know, the, other, the only other thing that I can think about, <clears throat> and this would help, you know in basketball when the shot clock goes off yeah. or, or goes down to zero, they have that red light that goes through? Why not put lights in the um, in the uh, uprights and when the clock strikes zero and the ball, ball is not snapped yet, and you should be able to review it. If we're going to review everything else, and the NFL is talking about reviewing uh, uh, pass interference penalties, why not review uh, a play that hasn't been... Um, taken in, in the right amount of time uh, as far as uh, a delayed game. You know, why not? You might, you might as well. You put, put, put up some light. If, if the NBA can do it, surely the NFL can do it, especially with all the money that they're generating. The other the other, the other other one was he faced back, Scott Goff, he was scrambling down in the red zone close to the five-yard line. Um, it, it, it was missed. Um, I've, seen, I've seen penalties missed as well. Um, could it have taken four extra points off the board? Absolutely. I mean, they were they, that would give them a first down, and they would have had four shots or three shots in the uh, inside the five yard line. So it was definitely a missed call. Do I think it changed the outcome of the game? No. Uh, the Rams still won the game, but it's definitely something that could have taken points off the board, and, and why you went to overtime. You mean put points on the board? Look, my point with these, my point, point on the board. Yeah, yeah. My point with these penalties that we're showing is, you know. If you're going to complain about the one call, saying that it was going to change the outcome of the game, and we're going to get to that in a minute, okay, at the end, then you got to say that this, okay, so let's say that the officials make all the obvious calls. I'm not going to say the delay game is obvious. They have to look at the watch, they have to look at the clock, they have to look at the ball, there's too many variables. I'm fine with that one being missed. That that happens, Okay. But when you see a guy's face jerk down when he's trying to dive or trying to scramble, I mean, you can't miss that when you're talking to me about player safety and you're talking about grabbing a face mask and ripping it down. So to me, that was about as obvious real time as the pass interference was at the end of the game. And that puts the Rams at first and goal as opposed to chalking out the field goal team and making it a 13-3 ball game. And trust me, 13-7 is a heck of a lot different than 13-3. And 14-13 at halftime is different than 13-10. to So if we're going to be complaining about obvious calls being missed, then we're talking about obvious calls being missed. Now there's two more, okay? And then we're going to get to the elephant in the room. The next one you're going to see was when the Rams went down the field and they ended up making it 20-20. to They threw a deep in, or I mean an in, just underneath the first down marker because I think it was like third and 11. And Cooks clearly gets face masked. Um, No, that was on the big pass play down the sideline. So the Rams should have had another 15 yards tacked onto that, and it should have been first and goal. Instead, as it was, okay, the Rams, you know, they didn't get the penalty and the extension on the yardage. And they ended up, eventually, I think on that drive, they ended up getting a field goal to make it 20-17. to Maybe, you know, but maybe the Rams get a touchdown on that drive because they're that much closer to the red zone. You know, I'm not going to play the what-if game because you're talking points and now you're trying to match points where where they aren't. But I will tell you, it was an obvious missed call that once again benefited the New Orleans Saints. And once again, at that time, the Rams had five penalties called on them and the Saints had zero. Okay, I want to keep that in perspective. The second picture that you're going to see okay, is Brandon Cooks, when the Rams were, when it was 20 
20 to 20. And the Rams were trying to go up the field and take the lead before they punted. Okay. Actually, I believe the 20 to 20 field goal. And then the Saints went up the field. So this was either the, this was the drive they punted. This was the last punt that they had in the second half. He gets the ball. He gets shy of the marker. The Saint defender leaps over and kicks him in the head. Now, I don't know if that's a penalty, but considering how the Saints had been cheap shotting our players in the previous game, and considering the contentious attitude, why are you know player safety? It's a missed call. At the very least, it should have been, if not flagged, at the very least, they should have stopped play and make sure that Cooks was okay, right? But it is a penalty, in case you're wondering. You can't leap onto the head of a human being on the football field, even if it's accidental. It's a penalty. Yeah, Remember? That's, uh, that's, yeah that's like an uh, unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, or even maybe even grounds for an ejection. I mean, you know, I, I think, like, Stopping on the head of a player is as bad as a punch. I, I would agree with you. Because if you get the cleat in the, in the right spot, I mean, that could take out somebody's eye. Right, or it could really do some damage to the brain. And after all, we're so concerned about concussions and player safety, right? So you're going to see the other two pictures on this next one. When we come out of the pictures, Eric's going to talk again and give his input on these two missed calls that once again benefited New Orleans... And did not benefit the Rams in any way, shape, or form. Here it is. All right, as you see on the picture on the left, another missed face mask penalty that should have uh, given the Rams 15 yards and an automatic first down. Um, uh, again, uh, the missed. Uh, play or missed penalty that that Goff uh, got or didn't get called earlier in the uh, in the game. So I, I, they're consistently um, missing calls. So I guess it's good to be consistent at something. Right. Um, as far as the Brandon Cooks getting uh, um, uh, a cleat on the head, I mean that's uncalled for. Like for many it doesn't matter. Um, uh, this isn't Albert Kingsworth bad, but it's still bad just because, you know, it's, it's still a cleat to the head. And while a player is down, and he's the most vulnerable while he's down, and, and there should have been a call that way. It could have been, as I mentioned before, on Sportsman Life 15 yards. It could have been a uh, 15 yards automatic ejection. Um, you know, it really depends. I didn't, I didn't see that play, but I can, I can just tell from the way it was. It could be right toward the end of a play, so maybe the refs weren't uh, – too concerned about it, but you still have to be concerned regarding player safety. Um, and that's not justifying what the Saints player did at all. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it could have been a continuation and maybe his um, momentum carried him that way. There's definitely a lot of factors, but the, the, uh, the foot to the face is a no-no. Well, here's, here's how you know if it's intentional or unintentional. When it happens... The defender turns around, goes down, and goes, oh, dude, I'm sorry, are you okay, and tries to help him up. The Saint defender did not do that. Period. We're going to talk about the whistles, which is absolutely illegal and against all rules, and no NFL organization is allowed to hand out whistles before a game, and yet you've got a guy who's known for bringing the whistle into the stadium? I, I, I don't think they handed out whistles. I'm thinking that these these people brought these brought this in. Well, their big here, famous right? fan, hold on, hold on. their big there, famous the fan is. is hold, hold on, on go, ahead, hold go ahead, Hold on, hold on. The funny thing is, is that when you go to a game now, you walk through metal detectors. So it's always conceivable that you know you could hide a whistle somewhere and bring it in yourself. That's not right. It's not allowed. It does happen. So I'm not saying that they're handing them out because that is definitely against NFL rules. Well, here's what I am going to say. The guy that I'm calling out, okay, he's one of the most famous Saint fans in the stadium. Everyone knows who he is, and that includes the Saint organization. And every game he brings a whistle. So right there, the organization's at fault. They know he's bringing them in. And it was funny because even Troy Aikman was like, it doesn't seem fair that they're allowed to have whistles in a stadium, but okay. 
Because there was a guy that was yeah, dressed up like Sean Payton. brought that up a handful of times. Yeah, yeah. So you talk about an unfair competitive advantage, and then you're going to complain to me about a pass interference penalty at the end of the game. All right. Now, I guess we got to address it since we're talking about it. So I talked about this first. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take too long on this, okay? And then I'm going to let Eric go, and then I'm going to have a closing thought on it, and I'll allow Ellie, or Eric to shut it down totally as we move on to the actual games. For me, it is a blown call. There is no question about it. But the reason I can sit here as a fan and be extremely proud of my Rams for winning this game and going to the Super Bowl is it gave New Orleans the tie regardless. So I'm going to go two thoughts here. One, let's look at what it did. It gave New Orleans the tie, or the lead. The Rams still had to go up the field and kick a 48-yard field goal to just force overtime. Okay? Then in overtime, you got the ball first. And unlike Tom Brady, who went up the field and scored a touchdown, you didn't. You had an opportunity to do that very same thing and go to New Orleans, and all of this is irrelevant. But instead, Fowler makes a play, Johnson makes an unbelievable interception, and Jared Goff makes two of his three greatest throws I've ever seen him make in his career, and they weren't even for big completions, but well, big yardage, but they were big completions, setting the Rams up, and the brass cojones of our coach to kick a 57-yard field goal, knowing that if they miss it, Breeze at the 45, game over. Make it or you lose the game. And Zerline makes it, in my opinion, the greatest field goal in NFC playoff history and maybe the second greatest field goal in NFL history. We'll let the experts decide on that one. So the element to me is you still had opportunities to win the game and you didn't do it. And the Rams still had opportunities to take over the game and they did it. It's not our fault. Okay, what are we supposed to do? Hey, Mr. Official, I actually did pass interfere. Can you please throw the flag now? Because you'd expect your players to do that. Now, the last thing that I'm going to talk about, okay, before I get into my closing thought, and then I'm going to turn over to Eric. The Rams organization got the worst screw job in NFL history. In the Super Bowl, and I would argue the Eagles and the Panthers are in this conversation as well. We were in a Super Bowl against the New England Patriots. They filmed our walkthroughs. They had a spy in the facility when it was supposed to be Rams time only. They got videotape on key plays that we were designing and keying up specifically for that team in the rematch. They dissected that film and they used it knowing when we were going to run it and what the looks were going to look like. Every expert that has talked about Spygate has said that kind of information is a seven-point swing. It guarantees the other team that you're playing against, it takes seven points away from them through the duration of the game. And I remind you, the Rams, Carolina, and Philadelphia all lost by three. You give those three teams an extra seven points, Patriots are 0-5 in Super Bowls at that point because they lost to Chicago and Green Bay. So... I don't, and then at the end, when the NFL found out, oh yeah, they did spy, sorry, they cheated, they won the Super Bowl anyway, Ram fans weren't asking for the Super Bowl trophy, Ram fans weren't asking to replay the game, Ram fans didn't do anything but go, what can we do? The result is the result. We know, as long as we're alive, this dynasty is tainted, and Patriot fans don't seem to care about it being tainted. So for those of you out there that want to go, you're a tainted NFC champion, fine. I'm a tainted NFC champion that's going to be playing in the Super Bowl against the New England Patriots, getting an opportunity to win our second Super Bowl in our history. So fine. Then we're tainted. <laughs> there, yeah, there's a difference between a tainted uh, NFC champion that didn't get, that, that, that flag wasn't thrown on an obvious pass interference penalty but you've never done anything like spy gate or deflate gate. Right. Okay. But the other team, the other team also known as bounty gate. So 
you know, bad calls, bad calls go, go throughout all of history for every sport. And, you know, this, this was a bad call. It, it was, it was, a, it was an eyesore on the, um, the NFL, the eyesore on officiating. Um, but I, I really thought that, uh, the, the one true bright spot of both games was the announcing from both sets of announcers on it. I actually thought Buck and Aikman had one of their best games. Agreed. And they're like, they, did, they didn't, um, you know, they weren't homerish for any team. They weren't, you know, they, they were trying to figure out why certain things were going on. Why are there whistles in the crowd? Why wasn't that, uh, why wasn't that called a pass interference? Um, uh, Nickel, uh, Lovey Coleman, um, you know, that sort of thing, like really questioning it and trying to find out why. And, you know, when you have that kind of, uh, broadcasting, it, it, it makes the game a lot more enjoyable yeah. and it really took away from the fact of what happened in the game just moments prior. And you're like, okay, I'm listening to what they're saying, and, and I'm not yelling at my TV over the volume, and I'm not throwing stuff at my TV and breaking the screen, so I don't know what's going to go on, okay? Um, you know what? It, it, it's a good call. Get over it. There's always next year. Like, trust me, you, you don't know how many times I would go back and um, make sure Mike Brown isn't injured. Uh, for the 2006 Super Bowl, or three years prior to where we should just clear out both sections, the, the two closest sections to where the foul ball landed in, in Chicago for the for Coach Marlins uh, 2003 Game 6 NLCS. Like, that was a bad call. Should they have called fan interference? You guys know what I'm talking about is the Bartman game. So, bad calls throughout history, okay? Fortunate, unfortunate bounces, bad luck, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Uh, move on. You know what? You know, I've been hearing people in New Orleans are, are, are sending this to, to court to try to get it overturned and whatnot, and let it go. You're wasting money and resources that could be used on other things. Uh, car salesman, in, uh, owner of a car sales lot in, in New Orleans, putting up 12 billboards around uh, Atlanta saying, oh, we were robbed, um, you know, everything, everything that he could think of. It's like, dude, why are you wasting your money? Like, we all saw it. Get over it. Okay? There's nothing more you can do, and it's not going to change. If it, would, if it was going to be changed, it would have been changed either yesterday or today because uh, Cadell has the authority to change the outcome or replay it from where that call was. But you know what? He's not going to, and I don't blame him. I think there would have been so much pressure from other organizations and sports organizations like NBA and, and, and MLB. You can't do that. You just can't do that because it's going to be an eyesore for any sport, especially that sport. Um, you know, look, if they weren't going to reverse Super Bowl 36 under those circumstances, I don't see them doing it over a blown call. And as I showed in the beginning of this video, you are not the only one to have a blown call. The 49ers in that 83 championship game had two blown calls in the final two minutes of the game that also cost them a ticket to the Super Bowl. But as I said at the end of that, what did they do? They used it as a cudgel. They went 15-1 and the next year. They beat the Bears in the championship game 23-0 to make a point that they weren't going to get beaten that round again. And then they beat the greatest Dolphin team in Dan Marino's career ever assembled and beat the doors off them 38-16. Drew Brees is coming back. Alvin Kamara is coming back. Marv Melvin Ingram is coming back. Uh, Thomas is coming back. You got your defense. It's going to be back and healthy. And Apple with an offseason to learn under the, new co uh, under the new system that he was – you know, traded to come into midway through the year. You're going to have free agency. You're going to have a draft. Start focusing on the offseason, win it, dominate it, and win the Super Bowl next year like you're capable of doing. But I'm worried when I hear Saint players still talking about this right now and the organization still talking about this right now. Dude, go to the Senior Bowl. Get over it. Move on. Use this. Worse has happened to other organizations or just as bad. I heard a funny one the other day that said instead of the Pro Bowl, the Rams or the uh, the Saints and Chiefs should play. Consolation Bowl. Yeah, that's right. Let's see who's uh, <laughs> third best. Right. Look, last thing that I'm going to say here is Eric's always been consistent. He's always said, "Don't let it come down to officiating. Don't let it. That's your fault. As a player, as a coach, that's your fault." And a lot of players will agree with Eric. 
I've also been consistent. I've complained about officiating for the last 10 years, 12 years. <clears throat> no one listened. No one listened. I've been saying that pass interference and defensive holding and face mask penalties, those three, <clears throat> because they're automatic first downs, should be challengeable. Period. Whether it was called or not, you should be able to throw the challenge flag and determine whether or not that was, pa that was pass interference, whether or not that was a face mask. And give coaches three challenges instead of two. And if they win, they get a fourth one. Right? So, you know, I don't have a problem with that. But everyone told me, I'm an idiot. Stop my complaining. God, officials are bad. We get it. Move on. Okay, well, all those years that my team was on the receiving end of where New, where New Orleans is at right now, I was told, just suck it up. But then the minute my team finally, for the first time in its history, benefits from one of those calls, and I may be exaggerating, I can't remember an end of the game going this way in, in favor of the Rams ever, at least in my lifetime, Maybe in a game, obscure game, I don't remember, but certainly never a postseason game, okay? I have never had the Rams benefit from a call like this, and the minute it does, we got to change the rules? We didn't learn from Bert Emanuel? Don't mess with the rule book? Although I agree on this one, we should mess with the rule book. But at least give me credit where credit's due. All of us out there that have been complaining about this for years because our football teams were borderline playoff or out and miss the playoffs every year because of officiating. While you guys were all living off the hog going to the Super Bowl, you were cool with it. But now that you're on the other end of it, it's the worst thing to ever happen. And I'm going to wrap it up with this. I'm going to wrap it up with this. You Saint fans, you literally, you have no credibility. None. Zero. You are absolutely abysmal in this conversation. You don't have a right to sit there and try to demand that they play the game over and that the complete structure of the game has to be different. And I'll tell you why. There was a Ram fan on Sunday after the Rams beat the Dallas Cowboys on Saturday, Sunday morning they announced that Vinovich was going to be announcing the Ram or uh, refereeing the Ram Saint game. And for six days, this man went around and got a petition saying this crew is garbage. They have no business being at this game. We don't want them. Get them out. He got a petition and over 7,000 signatures. And what did Saint fans say on Twitter? Oh, give me a break. Officials don't change outcomes of games. Just suck it up. You're not going to beat us anyway. You guys are already looking for an excuse on why you're going to lose in the Superdome. It never comes down to officiating. If it does, it's your fault. Really? My, how things are different on Monday morning. Isn't it funny that the very crew you defended, you now have a problem with? Maybe you should listen to Ram fans a little bit more often because we saw this coming from a mile away. But you know, as my father said, you crapped in the bed before bedtime. It's not my fault and I ain't doing the laundry. So pull the sheets over your head and go to bed because you're sleeping in it. Not that I ever crapped the bed. That's not like a real life story of something that happened to me. I want to be very clear with this. It's an expression about when you do something stupid and now you have to live with it. That's what he was saying, okay? It's not like I was 12 years old and crapped the bed. He's like, well, I'm not doing this. That was the worst analogy ever, but it makes sense at the same time because it was something my father used to tell me about when you make a mistake or when you, when you put yourself out there and it comes back and bites you in the rear end. So you have no credibility. You're the ones that said this officiating crew was fine and that we were overreacting. And the last thing that I'm going to say on this, the very last thing, it wouldn't have been in New Orleans if Vinovich had made the right call back in week nine. I'm not saying that because I think it. I'm saying it because I know it. Because you're not going to sit there and tell me that a fake punt or fake field goal early in a football game doesn't change the entire outcome and momentum of the game. Because I seem to remember you guys benefiting from that against Philadelphia. And then you got on the other end of that against us in the championship game. Back-to-back -back playoff games you were involved in, that very scenario panned out. Go back to week nine. It's a first down. Everyone in the booth, everyone in the stadium, everyone watching on TV knew that it was a first down. 
and y'all benefited from it. And you know what you said? Stop crying. Refs don't change outcomes of games. So you have no credibility. I don't want to hear it. And I will never bring this up again when this segment of the show is over. I will never refer to this penalty again because, yes, it was a blown call, but so was the Redskins in, in, in 49er game, just like you saw today. Eric, wrap it up. Yeah, let's go to the recap. Coming up next. All right, Ram Saints. Uh, this was the morning game, Eric. And I had said prior to the game, there's a few things that I want to talk about. We're going to say this a lot, I think, during this recap. But, you know, I'll go into your point that you had made, or you can go into your point. The point that I made was I said that in order for the Rams to really take the next step, and I believe that they were going to win because I believe this was going to happen, the Rams need a Jared Goff moment. For me, there's you know you could talk about the defense and they played great. You could talk about Marcus Peters because he played outstanding. You could talk about Johnny Johnson because he played amazing. Aaron Donald, Dadamik and Sue probably played their best tandem game of the year. But this does not happen. Without Jared Goff. There was no Todd Gurley. Robert Woods was horrible. He was slipping and falling all over the field. He was overextending himself for catches and taking himself to the ground rather than keeping his feet. The only one that was really getting open and, 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 and making big plays consistently on the money with Goff's throws was Brandon Cooks. But Jared Goff was in this game down 13-0 in New Orleans. He had a 13-point deficit and a 10-point deficit that he overcame. And I don't think that can be understated. And I had said that Jared Goff needed a Jared Goff moment, a playoff moment that would be, would put him in a class, you know, of the elites. And for me, the drive to tie the game, the drive to tie the game again and force overtime, and the drive to win the game, which wasn't much of a drive, it was two completions but out of three attempts, but they were two unbelievable completions with guys in his face putting it right on the money where he needed to, and the play being made. Um, it can't be overstated. Jared Goff's the MVP of this game. And we're not in Super Bowl 53 without Jared Goff as our quarterback. And I was just so impressed with him. The moment was never too big. He never got too frustrated. I think there was a moment there where he was a little annoyed with the fans being so loud. But I think it was more annoyance with the equipment that wasn't working as well as he would have liked it to. Um but man, this kid is just cool as a, cool as a cucumber, and he just didn't he just didn't waver. And I want to point this out: when Jared Goff and 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 Drew Brees met the first time in his rookie year, they were going throw for throw in the first half, and then Drew Brees blew him out of the water. Okay, outperformed him. But if you look at now these the last three times these two quarterbacks have played, Jared Goff outperformed him in L.A. Jared Goff outperformed him in New Orleans the first game. And Jared Goff outperformed him again in this game. Now, I don't know of another time where a quarterback outperformed a Hall of Famer in three straight matchups and didn't get any of the credit. But if this kid doesn't get credit this week for what he did in this game against New Orleans, then I'm just conceding the fact that they are never going to acknowledge Jared Goff as a quarterback in the National Football League because I was so impressed with his performance. And for me, that was a big key. Another key was running the ball, which didn't happen. But we did talk about the defense needing to step up and make plays. We both kind of touched on the D. So I'll turn it over to you, Eric, um, and then I'll wrap up something, and then we're good. You know, Jared Goff is never going to get that. Uh, he's never going to get those accolades until you guys get rid of Johnny Hacker. All right? I mean, he just puts up gaudy quarterback stats. <laughs> and he just makes Goff look, he just makes Goff look like a collegiate athlete. <laughs> so here's the thing. You know, the Rams got a gift turnover. I'm sorry, the Rams gave a gift turnover to the Saints early in the game, and the Saints could only um, take a field goal to go up 6 nothing. That was and huge. And really, really, you get a gift, you know, off of uh, receiver's hands and then to your linebacker. Uh, or that was off Gurley's hands, I should say. But, you know, you see something like that, you need to put seven points on the board. You don't score four points, it's going to cost you a game. And for New Orleans, it did. Um, but I will tell you that that's not what lost the game for New Orleans. 
Okay? And I've been saying this ever since the game ended. But Sean Payton's ego lost this game for New Orleans. The pass interference call should never have been a first down throw. Okay? There is 149 left on the clock. Run the ball. The Rams have two timeouts. Okay? Run the ball. There's five seconds that go off the clock, depending on how long you're running for, particularly five seconds, because you're going to run up the middle. How they come up the middle? Okay? Second down. You're going to run the ball again. Make the Rams use their second timeout. Okay? Another five seconds go- at least goes off the clock. So now you're down to 139. You run the ball again. Take all the way down to, uh, you know, take the delay of game penalty, and you're down to 50, anywhere between 55 and 59 seconds. Well, just call a timeout. Well, they had no, no, no. Well, you did get a little better angle on the field goal, and you either call timeout or take the delay of game. It doesn't matter which we do. Maybe you want to save a timeout for something. I don't know. Okay? But, again, you have 55 to 59 seconds left on the clock, and the Rams have no timeouts. Did the Rams go down and kick that? The inside field goal, uh, right before overtime, we'll never know. Because Sean Payton decided to throw to not Michael Thomas, not Taysom Hill, not Alvin Kamara, not Mark Ingram, but to Drake Juan Smith. Okay? Well, and on first that's down, he threw to Thomas. That's the problem. Okay? Sean Payton lost that game for his team, and that's who Saints fans should be mad at. Yeah. We okay. don't... It, now... Go ahead. Let's see here. Hold on. Let me... Okay. Let me, let me bring this up to me. Let's see if I'm right. Hold on. Okay. Okay. So, it was, it, it was Michael Thomas on, on first down. I said Drake Watson. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. It was Tommy Lee Lewis. My, my, my apologies. Tommy Lee Lewis on third down. Why are you throwing on third down? Why are you even throwing in that situation where you need the rant, where you need to take away the two timeouts for the Rams? That's what happens. You threw short left to Michael Thomas on first down. Why? At the 13 yard line. Run the ball. Then Kamara runs for no game. Okay, fine. Great. Run the ball. Run the ball. I mean, there, there's no other way to say this. But they could have even ran the ball on third down, and the Rams would have, t- would have had to take their take their third time out. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing, too, Eric. You text me during the game, and you're like, "Why is Drew Brees not in the game, and Tyson Taysom Hill is inside the five yard line?" That, that's another thing. Like, why are you still running gimmicky plays in the NFC Championship game? Those gimmicky plays didn't get you there. You know, block punts uh, to help swing uh, a game uh, your way against Tampa helped you win, helped uh, change the momentum of the, of the game. But Taysom Hill is not going to be that person who is going to change. You're not going to put the ball in his hands. What do they do when they put the ball in his hands to hand off the commodity? He's fumbled, okay? If, he, if, if the Rams recover, that's costly for them. That's costly for those things. Mm-hmm. Well, and here's the thing too: is even after they got touchdown, and I love that you annou- that you gave the announcers credit for this game because I thought in both games they were amazing as well. But even even uh, I think it was Troy Aikman or Joe Buck was like, "Well, Taysom Hill finally got his touchdown. Clearly, they wanted him to get a touchdown in the championship game." You know, when your focus is getting a guy a stat in the championship game, that tells me two things: a) you have no respect for your opponent, which clearly Sean Payton didn't. And number two, you didn't prepare well for the game. Because instead of focusing on what your opponent does, you're focusing on who's going to get the big stats going into the Super Bowl. And I just, it was a classic example of them believing their own hype. You know, what I love about Sean McVay, and what makes Sean McVay, in my opinion, a better coach than Sean Payton, is, is he does put his ego aside. He's willing to run the ball and not throw the ball all over the lot. He's willing to hand the ball off to C.J. Anderson. He's willing to bench his superstar running back because he's not performing, whether there's an injury there or not. And his player has so much respect for him as a coach that he's not getting upset and yelling about it after the game. He's accepting the fact that his performance was poor enough, and he agrees with the benching. Sean Payton doesn't have that kind of control of his football team. 
He just does it. And and he is a gimmicky coach. On sidekick in the in the Super Bowl. That's his MO. He's oh, a gimmicky was, guy. That was a great play though. Because it worked. That's the yeah, nice but there's no there, but the Colts weren't even expecting. No, I like, but it's still he, a, he pulled it off at the right time. I agree, but it's still a gimmicky play, Eric. That's all I'm saying. He's a gimmicky coach. I'm not saying that because I think Sean Payton's a bad coach. I think, in my opinion, it's Belichick, Payton, and then you can make the argument for Sean McVay right now if he continues his upward career. But certainly Andy Reid, I think the four best coaches in football were all competing on Sunday. And how you want to put them in in order is up to you entirely. After Belichick. Bill Belichick is number one. Now you want to mix and match you know, two through four, that's your decision. But... I just he it, that's just his thing. He's a gimmicky coach. He'll he'll find these weird plays that he practices and calls at the absolute right time, and it benefits his football team almost every time. Again, I'm not saying it is a slam, but it can't be overstated that Jared Goff and his performance in this game. I, you know, Marcus Peters, I said was going to have two picks and a forced fumble. Uh, he didn't have that. But what he did have was three tackles, a pass breakup, and they ignored his side of the field for most of the second half. Now, if you don't think Marcus Peters had a great game, then you didn't watch the NFC Championship game. That's all I have to say about that. But, Eric, what was your big takeaway from this game from the Rams' perspective? Two questions for you. One, what impressed you the most? And two, what is your biggest takeaway? takeaway is the Rams' ability to keep playing at their level of succeeding. And what I mean by that is they didn't let the crowd noise get to them. It, it, it was a little obvious in the first, uh, early in the first half, but they somehow were able to get it under control, um, even though the game was close to route. So, you know, their, their perseverance actually is what really stood out. And, and Goff's making the throws and, and actually you know, scrambling and making plays with his legs. I mean, you know, that, those sustained drives, and that's what, uh, the, that's what the Rams were looking for with, uh, with only 77 yards of rushing and Goff getting 10 of those yards. And Anderson and, and Gurley not even having the best of games. You know, I, I have to but, agree. Go, go ahead. But I also like, I also like the fact, and, and I even said this, uh, during the preview, but I also like the fact that the tight ends were heavily involved. They had to be. You called it. You called the tight ends in this game unbelievably. Um, the Rams haven't utilized the tight ends that much all year long, and I thought it was. I thought it was amazing. Um, I was. I was most impressed with uh, Marcus Peters um, for all the heat that because I expect Jared Goff to play well, and I'm. I'm going to get to my takeaway in a minute. But Marcus Peters and and the perseverance. I'm going to put these two things together. Is what. I think impressed me the most is the Rams, and and I'm going to get to this. You're going to get to this statistic in a minute. There, there's an interesting stat that Eric texted me early in the game that did not surprise me um, because it's just not what the Rams have ever been known for, uh, their style of play or just their heart. Um, it's it's always been when tested, it's always wilted. Um, Marcus Peters played great and he persevered through an incredibly difficult season an incredibly difficult opponent the last time these two teams met, tore him apart and made a mockery of him, and he came to play. And when you when you look at that and then the Rams' perseverance of overcoming a 13-0 deficit, overcoming a 20-10 deficit, and winning this football game in the way in which they won it with their defense getting the ball for their offense, their offense getting their special teams in position, and then Legatron hitting a 57-yard game-winning field goal Right down the middle in overtime, knowing that if he missed it, that guy is getting back on the field at, the, at his own 45-yard line. You can book the Saints in the Super Bowl at that point. I don't care what the Rams defense thinks they can do. He's winning the game at that point. That's how crucial that kick was. So the perseverance for me was a big thing. but Or, or what impressed me the most. But I think my biggest takeaway in this is that Jared Goff is every bit as good as I thought he was and a little bit better. I didn't know Jared Goff could do this. I hoped he could. That's why I said we needed a Jared Goff moment. Um, we needed a playoff moment, a championship-type moment from our quarterback. 
because I've never had it. Uh, as much as I love Jim Everett and Vince Ferragamo, and, and, and they played great in their careers, and they had some big games, but never a comfort behind victory like this in a game of this magnitude, in a stadium like that, with all the odds against you, and playing the way that he had the last half of the season, this was a big moment that I hoped Jared Goff had, but I didn't know. And my biggest takeaway is we have ourselves a franchise quarterback that is capable of winning multiple championships in his career. Now we just got to keep him healthy. Uh, Eric, share with the fans that statistic because I thought it was fascinating going into Sunday. Since, since 2007, the Rams were 1 in 80 when trailing by 13 or more points and then win the game. 1 in 80, and they won it. And correct me if I'm wrong, but their postseason record was over throughout their history. They, they never came from 13 down in a playoff game before. Nope. So, you know, that's a huge, huge statistic. Uh, the last thing that I want to say is Adam Schefter. Uh, Eric, you text me, or you called me, and we talked about this. Go ahead and, 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 and tell the fans how our conversation broke down. About the are Saints. You talking about what he, are you talking about what he tweeted? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, Adam Schefter tweets out, mini miracle and a no call on pass interference um, have got to be the two toughest ways to lose in back-to-back postseasons. And... Um, Two words come to mind that another organization can probably has the top spot on, and that is the drive and the fumble. Yep. And I told you when you're like, I know you're going to know this answer, but what's the first thing you think? I'm like, the Cleveland Browns, 86-87, the drive and the fumble. Um, Right. I mean, it goes back to what I've been saying all along, guys, that these pundits, these quote-unquote experts, and again, I use that term loosely, Their knowledge of professional football does not go beyond Tom Brady's rookie year of 2000. Anything 99 and beyond, they just know from highlights on the NFL network. They don't know about the, you know, the Ram-Viking rivalry of the 70s. They don't know about, you know, the, the Buccaneers' abysmal decade of the 80s. They don't know anything pre 2000 Post-2000, they'll tell you everything you need to know. And a perfect example is at the end of the day, when I'm watching and I hear somebody say that this was the worst officiating at the end of a championship game in the history of professional sports, and I'm sitting there going, you're an idiot. And challenge accepted. It took me 48 hours. It didn't even take me that long to find the 1983 NFC championship game to obliterate that statement clean out of the water. But again, it's pre-2000. Anything from 99 on, back, forget it. They don't even know. They probably think Otto Graham was a center for the Philadelphia Eagles in 2001. Okay, that's how ignorant these people really are. So if you want real news, you want real information, you want real facts and real stories and real history of the game, I'm your network. I'm your show. Wear your show. Wear your network. Because Eric knew that. And we laughed about it because we both knew that. Red Right 88. That was a pretty crappy way to end the season too, huh? How about the Buffalo Bills? Throwing an interception at the goal line in 1989 in the divisional playoff game against the Browns as time expired. And then the very next year, oh, I don't know. You know, maybe these two words may ring a bell wide right. I kind of think that's a little bit worse than the New Orleans Saints, don't you? Also divisional playoff game, but then a Super Bowl. What's worse? I don't know. I can only fathom. Anyway, big win for the Rams. Or, or, or you could say Buffalo for four straight years. So you could go there too, right? No one else can make that claim. No one else can make that claim. But all I do know is... I called the Rams to win. I told you guys the Rams are going to the Super Bowl way back in the summer. And here we are. Super Bowl 53. NFC champs going to the show. 
Next up, a really great game. I want to note, um, just to wrap up that last game, I know we said we were going to jump into the Patriots and, and Chiefs, and I want to, but you'll notice the Rams' little helmet deal where I had NFC champions. I think it's fascinating. I count NFL championship games and AFL championship games. I don't just start with the Super Bowl era. So when you look at that, the Rams are actually 6-9 and nine all-time in championship games. Um, it's a tough one to do with the NFL and AFL championship because there was no Super Bowl. So technically, if they won, they were also world champs. But since the Super Bowl was invented and there was that extra game, I just clump all the championship games together. It's not their fault that there was no Super Bowl prior. So the fact that the Rams are 6-9, and nine, that, that's 15 times they've been, to the, they've been to this step in the postseason. And in the Super Bowl era, they've, they've won four of them um, now. But they've obviously been to less than – this is their 10th. Right now they're four and um, six in conference championship games. So, but they're four, they're six and nine all time overall in that round. Now, leading into this game, Chiefs Patriots. I told you guys if the Rams won, I was going to be a diehard New England Patriot fan. I was going to root for New England like a crazy mofo. They go up fourteen nothing. Eric texts me the funniest thing ever. He's like, it's like watching a high school play a play a professional football team right now. This is ridiculous. It's terrible. It's awful. Fourteen to nothing. What's going on? You know, Eric's all upset. Um, and then he texts me in this third quarter, be careful what you wish for. And I'm like, it's funny because I had two other people text me that very same thing. Um, Eric, I watched the game later. Um, I needed, uh, I needed some time to process, uh, and celebrate the Rams victory, but also I wanted to look at Tom Brady objectively, maybe for the first time since 2001. And I'm not kidding when I say that I'm fully aware of my bias against him has been well-documented. Um, so I watched the game Monday. But take us through what you saw. I saw a precision surgical procedure. That's what I saw. Tom Brady, outside of two throws, looked phenomenal. I mean, a three-headed monster running back tandem. Trio, I should say. Although, you know, James White came off a 15-catch performance against the Chargers and really really was held at bay by the, uh, by the Chiefs. And I, and I think a little bit by the weather, too, because there were a couple of uh, screen passes. And he dropped two passes. Well, one was a bad pass from Brady, but the other one he, he flat-out dropped. And he only had 23 yards on the ground, and he only caught four, four for 49 uh, through the air. So he was kind of held quiet. But talking about the other two... Uh, Sony Michelle had two touchdowns early, or one in each half, and then Rex Burkhead took over late. And I think that's what the Patriots are used to doing now: is wear them down with one or two guys and bring in another guy, and and uh, and just you know pound the rock. But you know, I don't want to hear about the elements. I don't want to hear about overtime. I don't want to hear about anything else except this game was one-sided in the in the first half, and then finally. Kansas City decided to come out and play, scored quickly in the third, and then put up 24 points in the fourth. While uh, while, the, the Patri- while the Patriots were up 7 uh they were at the goal line, and Brady instead threw or tried to throw to Gronk, and it was picked off by uh, Reggie Ragland, which could have put them up maybe 21 nothing at halftime <clears throat> because they ended up scoring another touchdown in the second quarter. I'll tell you, Brady was, was hitting his um, receivers early and late. Uh, I love the fact that Gronkowski decided to show up in this game. He, he does not look great, uh, but he showed up, and he, he was a mall in the run blocking game, and, and he, he went out and caught some passes. And I'll tell you, it was a really good joy to, to listen to Tony Romo during this game because he's highlighting Gronkowski. He said, no, they're going to go up top. Sure enough, they go up top to Gronkowski. Oh, it's third down, and, and uh, there's Edelman in the slot. Edelman catches the ball. Shocking. Um, I mean, Brady looked 
Brady looked really good. He didn't let the elements affect him too much. Uh, the defense played really well in the uh, in the first half, and actually throughout the third quarter, I think it was about a two or three play drive by the Chiefs when they scored their first touchdown. But we saw this before. You know, we saw this in Week Six where the Chiefs um, didn't get any passing touchdowns or, or anything in, in the first half. Uh, in New England in the regular season, and Mahomes had, what, 35-something yards passing yeah. in the uh, first half, and, you know, no touchdowns. It was like, wow, what's what's wrong with Kansas City? But, you know, you never count out a team at home in the playoffs, and and Kansas City didn't, didn't allow that to happen, and New England didn't put away Kansas City when they could have. So what does Mahomes do? Oh, he just throws three touchdowns in the uh, in the second half. Um, Damian Williams gets three touchdowns in the second half, and uh, you know Kelsey gets a big touchdown catch. But lo and behold, Tyreek Hill was was very very quiet. I will give you props, Anthony, because you mentioned Jimmy Watkins would have a good game. You even called about 130 something yards and two touchdowns. I mean. Outside the touchdowns, not far off. He had 114 yards receiving on four catches. And if he stays on his feet for two of those catches, he scores a touchdown. So you had it right there. Yeah. Very close. Yeah. I um, just I just felt like he was an element they, they needed to utilize. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I'm not always right uh, when it comes to what I think is going to happen in a game. I'm not always wrong what I think is going to happen or, or, or what not in a game. But I do <laughs> say, and I want to point out that I said the only key to this game was Bob Sutton, the defensive coordinator for Kansas City. Yeah. New, I... England, New, England, New England held the ball for over eight minutes on their first drive. <laughs> you know what that does for the defense? Let me, let me rephrase that question. You know what that does for the 31st ranked defense? Forget Not only it. tires them out, but that that takes their confidence away. Oh yeah, that that really puts a damper on later on in the game. And I wanted to see if Bob Sutton would make adjustments, and he didn't. And the Patriots, the Patriots could have probably scored on every possession if they wanted to. Yeah, that's how that's how efficient their offense was, and that's how inefficient the defense was. So what happened on Tuesday afternoon, Anthony? They fired one. Bob, they... Bob Sutton got canned. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess I'm not really shocked um, that that happened. And I just had this feeling that this is the one team that you wanted to have a good defensive showing on, especially only giving up 18 points at home in the regular season. And you gave up 13 in the divisional, or yeah, in the divisional round against the Colts, and then you turn around and give up 37 in New England. Yeah. Uh, you know, credit to Chiefs coming back. Patrick Mahomes is a wizard when it comes to comebacks against the Patriots in two games of the season, one in New England and in, in, in the AFC Championship game. Credit to Damian Williams; he had a great game catching the ball. Um, there really wasn't uh, outside of Sony Michelle. There really wasn't anybody who stood out running the ball. I mean, Rex Burkett got a lot of in close carries at the goal line, but Michelle had 113 yards. It was it was all the passing game, and it was this was a really fun game to watch to yeah. see when is Tyree Hill going to break out? When is Travis Kelsey going to have that moment? Um, and you know what they did? It. They did. No. Damian Williams and Sammy Watkins. When Sammy Watkins and Damian Williams have their moments, and your two other superstars are kind of held quiet. You know, right then and there, you're 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 done. You're done. Well, you know, right? Bel- go ahead. I was going to say Edelman had a great game. He had seven for seven or seven, uh, seven catches for ninety six yards. Um, I will tell you this: if you go to ESPN and you go to the Patriots Chiefs game and you go to the box score, there is New England and Kansas City videos, and it's a uh, it's a minute twenty nine. Okay, the first. The uh, highlight they show is the tip pass off of Edelman's hands, okay? This was 17-14 in the fourth quarter, okay? Patriots had the ball. Uh, Brady throws a second pick of the game. And Edelman takes a hit to the head. Nobody said a word. Like, you can go and watch the replay. The, the uh, Chiefs defender pretty much just flew in the air and lunged that, lunged that element. Where was the flag on that? 
Yeah. You know, that was that's targeting, if you ask me. Oh, yeah. Um, and 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 the uh, the Patriots are lucky that Edelman wasn't out for the rest of the game there because there was there was not that much time left in the game. So yeah, there was a missed call. There were a lot of missed calls. Um, D four lining up off sides. It's like, what are you doing? Like, oh my God. look down where you're lining up because your eyes are past the football. If your eyes are past football, dude, you're off sides. You're lined up in the neutral zone. You're further than where you need to be. And I'm sorry, the refs shouldn't have to tell you that you're lined up off sides. And Eric, they don't. Eric, yourself. Andy Reid is such a lying sack of Siamese snake crap. It is a courtesy. It is not a requirement. And they don't have to warn the coaching staff that he's lining up off sides. You are a professional yeah, football like, player. Figure it out. That felt, that felt like he was really fishing to try to find something. And, and, and I, I'm and i sorry, Andrew Reed, but let it go. Um, your, your guy lined up on sides. You should tell him, hey, dude, I have an idea. Don't line up on sides. Yeah. Okay? It's a learning experience. Yeah. And, and you know what's funny is that um, after the Patriots scored a touchdown with 30 seconds left, what do I get? But a text message from Anthony saying, hey, watch the Chiefs tie it up. I'm like... Okay, like three plays later, I'm like, whatever. <laughs> well, I had told you, let them score. Let them score. Don't don't stop them. And I don't know if that's what they did, but of course he scored on that play. And, I'm, and as soon as it happened, I did. I text you. I'm like, watch him tie it up. <laughs> and three plays later, we're going to overtime. Um, look, for me, I, you know, I looked at this game and I said to myself, okay, the only way the Patriots are going to win this game is if Tom Brady wins it. And I thought to myself on Monday when I was watching the game, I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to say something that's going to really shock the system. And it's going to shock a lot of people. I don't judge greatness by yards thrown. I don't judge it by QBR. I don't judge it by interception to touchdown ratio, although that's a factor. I judge it by your ability to do things in situations most men can't at your position. Now, with that being said, I am not saying this because of the statistics. I am not saying this, I should rephrase that, I'm not saying this because of the passing yardage statistics. I am not saying this because of the touchdown records that this individual has set throughout the course of his career. I am saying this simply for three reasons. One, in, his, in those situations where you need the guy to show and flash and perform, he's done it. Over and over and over again. And when you're talking about getting to the Super Bowl nine times, let that sit in. Okay? 31 other NFL franchises haven't even made it to nine in their history. And this guy has led this organization to nine Super Bowls. I had, I was the last one on board. It stopped and asked, do you want on or not? And I looked around and I realized that I was an audience of one. And I was in, I would be foolish to not get on this bandwagon after this game after this performance, after this incredible record of nine Super Bowl appearances. But I'm going to say this, and I mean it, and I don't say this lightly. Tom Brady, some of you are like, no kidding. Uh, Tom Brady's the greatest quarterback in NFL history. And I don't even know how you debate it at this point. I really don't. Um... It blows me away. You you take what the man did against Atlanta in that Super Bowl, you know, and you couple it with what he did in in Kansas City this year to get to the Super Bowl. The man's unbelievable. And the Patriots don't win this game without him. And yeah, fault the Chiefs. They didn't play the defense the way I would play it. 
but all he does is go out there and beat you anyway. And unlike he's done all year long, in this game, Eric, he was unbelievable throwing the ball 20 yards downfield or more. I think he was four of six in downfield well, passing. When well, when you're throwing against a 31st ranked defense, and it's like it's like throwing through a huge uh, thing of Swiss cheese with holes the size of the sun. But he's missed those he's throws this much. year. But he's missed those throws, and he didn't in this he game. Has. I was impressed. I mean, I, I, it's not that I haven't been impressed with Tom Brady his whole career, because I have, but I've been impressed with him for different reasons, and then those reasons aren't the same the next year because he's not doing those same things. And as you look over his career, that's another thing that I think is fascinating. You know, Joe Montana, you knew what Joe Montana was about. You knew what Joe Montana was going to do to you, and you knew how great Joe Montana was, period. But with Tom Brady... You know. Speaking of, you saw him in the building on Sunday night, right? No. Yeah, he was there. He was there rooting on the Chiefs, and that was Tom Brady's idol growing up. Yeah, well, he played for the Chiefs. I mean, I can understand why he was there rooting for the Chiefs, but, you know, and it was Tom Brady's idol growing up. He was a San Francisco Bay kid or a Bay Area kid, but, um, I, you know, that's the other thing about Tom Brady that's fascinating is Tom Brady in 2003 is not Tom Brady in 2007. He's a different quarterback. Tom Brady in 2007 isn't Tom Brady in 2010. He's a different quarterback. Tom Brady, the year they beat Atlanta in the Super Bowl, is not the same Tom Brady that went to the Super Bowl last year and was NFL MVP. And this year's Tom Brady isn't that same Tom Brady. He's able to morph into whatever he needs to to win football games, and it just blows me away. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and I doubt well, he, we will. He, 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 he's unselfish. I mean, how many times have I said that? You know, the biggest difference between him and Rodgers, Rodgers puts up all the stats. He can throw he can throw uh, footballs through windows the size of uh, gopher holes. And, um, you know, Tom Brady doesn't take the almighty dollar. What did Aaron Rodgers do before the season? He signed the richest contract for a quarterback in NFL history. Yeah. Uh, it just goes to show you, like, Tom Brady doesn't do that because he wants other people around him, whether it's offense or defense, to, to help them win because they buy into what Belichick is selling. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, congratulations. I got what I wanted. Um, pretty good this postseason. I was 7-3 and three in the playoffs this year. Eric, do you know what your record was? 7-3. Uh, 7-3 or 8-2. Didn't you pick the, the Chiefs or did you pick the Patriots? Uh, I picked the Chiefs. Okay, so we're both 7-3. and three. So, now we go to the Super Bowl. And, yeah, so overtime conversation coming up next. All right, so the last little bit of controversy, of course, there's one in every game, and there was one in this one because, you know, no one can take defeat and accept it gracefully and, and get ready for next year. Everyone's got to find a reason why their team didn't win. Um, you know, last year when the Rams lost to Atlanta, what did I say? Don't put this on Farrell Cooper. They played like crap. Moving on. We'll see you next year. Right? That's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, it's the refs. Or, oh, it's overtime now. That's the argument for this game. I had told people I didn't want the overtime rule changed because for people like the overtime rule changers, nothing is ever good enough. Those very same people that came out and said this was the best system they could think of, this was the most fair overtime rules they've ever heard of, they're so glad that this is the way it is now. And boy, the NFL really got this rule change right. Those very same people are now crying foul and want touchdowns to not end games either. So here's my suggestion. This is the rule change I want to come up with. If you get to overtime, okay, in a playoff game, both get to advance and both get to play, you know, with the, with the confidence and the knowledge of knowing that they played good enough and, and they should all be champions. Anyone that made the playoffs should get a nice little participation trophy. Like the, you know, we won't call it the Lombardi trophy participation trophy. What could we call it? Um, we could call it the Marv Levy trophy, right? Cause he got the four Super Bowls. We'll call it the Marv Levy trophy and everyone gets one. And in this way, no one's feelings gets hurt. 
and we're all champions. Because after all, isn't that the direction we've gone in the National Football League today? Guys, I don't know what to tell you, okay? This is the way it is. You have three aspects to your football team. Special teams and defense. It's not just offense. Use your... It's not my fault your defense sucks. It's not Tom Brady's fault. Do what the Rams did. Stop them. Otherwise, you don't ha there's no argument for me here. And I find it so disgusting that these idiots are getting on television going, it's not fair that Mahomes didn't get a shot at the ball and, and an opportunity in overtime. Sure he did. They lost a toss. But he still had an opportunity. Those 11 guys on the other side of the ball needed to do their job. Mahomes had an opportunity. His defense just didn't deliver it for him. Does his defense get the opportunity if Mahomes goes up the field and scores a touchdown? Sure. If he turns the ball over, his defense gets an opportunity. I don't know what to tell you. This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I cannot believe that it's happening. But why? Because the Patriots won. If the Chiefs won the toss and went up the field and scored that touchdown, this conversation is not happening. It's all about Mahomes and the Super Bowl. You agree? How soon people forget what happened in the Super Bowl two years ago. Huh? Eight what? plays, 75 yards, three minutes, 58 seconds, a James White two-yard touchdown run to seal the victory for the Patriots over the Falcons. Falcons never touched the ball in overtime. No one complained. Oh, uh, yeah, well, because because they because Matt Ryan isn't on the same level as Patrick Mahomes. Oh, Patrick man. Mahomes hasn't won hasn't won the MVP yet, and he can still go to somebody else. I mean, the, the, the votes are all tallied, and and they're going to uh, he's going to win it. They're going to they're they're, they're going to reveal it on on uh, the Saturday before the Super Bowl. But he's going to win it. it, it just, the, the Patriots are used to this. They know what they have to do. They win the, they win the coin toss. You're not getting the ball back. You're not. Okay? So it's up to your defense to put on their big boy pants and go get a three and out. Go make them punt. Okay? Because you don't want to leave it in Tom Brady's hands. So what did the Patriots do? They won, they won the uh, toss. They went 13 plays. 75 yards. And the Chiefs had three chances, three, to make the Patriots punt or yeah. take a field goal. 3rd mm -hmm. and 9, 3rd and 10, 3rd and 10. And let me tell you what happened on those third down plays. Okay? Uh, actually, I'm at the, uh, I'm on the Super Bowl, so of course I'm going to put that. 3rd and 10 at the New England 35. Tom Brady passed short middle to Julian Edelman for 20 yards. 3-10 at the Kansas City 45. Tom Brady passed short middle to Julian Edelman for 15 yards. 3-10 at the Kansas City 30. Tom Brady passed short left to Bob Ruthkowski for 15 yards. Never went to another third down again. And you know what? Stop crying. Stop crying. Because your defense, you have 11 players on defense for a reason. Oh, yeah. And if you're not able to, if you're not able to make one stop, you don't belong there. Sorry. What happened in the Super Bowl? You would get ran out of the building. Oh yeah. Look. With that defense. Well, and and to me, it's such a great game. Mahomes played unbelievable. I'm really curious to see what Mahomes does in year two. Um, I know it's his third year as a quarterback. Year two. Well, yeah, second year as a starter. Okay, he played one game last year. I'm not counting that. Um, but I'm curious to see what he said. What he what we see out of him year two as a starter year three of his career. Um, it's going to be tough to repeat. So I expect a drop-off. Yeah. I just don't know how much of a drop-off, and I don't know if that drop-off is necessarily going to be um, in the win total either. Um, it may not be. It may be. Um, Mahomes is a special talent so far. And unequivocally, anyone wants to call him a bust, they don't know football. Um, the kid's a hit. He's far. He's far from that. He's far from that. He's a hit. 
just like Jared Goff is a hit. Um, Tom Brady is the best quarterback to ever play the game. And there's no shame in losing to him. And if the Rams bookend his career and he ends up riding off in the sunset with a sixth ring and he started his career beating the Rams and he ended his career beating the Rams, fine. It's a bitter pill. I'll swallow it. I won't like it. I'll hate every little bit of it. But at least it was to Tom Brady um, and not to Trent Dilfer, right? Um, if this game goes the other way and the Rams end his career, I can't think of a more fitting way for a career to go. The very team that you took, you took the dynasty from and ripped it out of their hands and gave it to your own team and you ran with it like a champ for 20 years, 20 plus years, almost 20 years. For that team to then meet you at the end of the road and get handed that baton and take their dynasty back and run with it with this new crop, I mean, that's the stuff Hollywood writes. That's not the stuff that usually unfolds on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening in the Super Bowl, but I'm hoping like the Dickens it does. Um, last question for you, Eric, and then we'll wrap up. This show's wrapped up. Does Tom Brady retire with a loss in Super Bowl 53? I'm not giving away my pick now. I'm no, no pick. If he loses, does he does he retire? No. If I he, think Gronkowski does, but I think Brady comes back. If he wins Super Bowl 53, does he retire? Uh, he's having too much fun now. I think he's back. Either way. There you have it. Um, me personally, I don't know. I, I don't like saying this guy's going to retire. Let me, let me just say this. It would be very tempting to walk away after a Super Bowl win this year, especially after coming up just short last year. Well, and do you think the opponent matters to bookend your career that way? No. Just, no, because it's Two different, two different, uh, well, of two course. Different, uh, like early years, late years. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter. He just happens to be back. I, look, I um, I was gonna say something. Um, I am not gonna sit here and say somebody should retire. Uh, I am going to say that the experts can pretend like there's no crack in this armor. He can run around and pretend like he's no different than he was 15 years ago, three years ago. I'm telling you, and I've been saying it from day one, I've seen it all year long, Tom Brady has lost a step. The problem is, when Tom Brady loses a step, he's still five steps better than everybody else. Okay? So that doesn't mean... That's because of adjustments. Agreed. So it doesn't mean his career is over or that what but he is definitely easier to defend against now than he ever has been. It doesn't mean he's easy to beat. He's just easier to game plan for. Cuz see he could still audible and do those things, but you know what his arm is capable and incapable of doing. So that makes it easier to game plan. But he still can put that ball through a tight window, he could still get that ball in the right guy's hands in the unthinkable moment on third down, and that's what makes him dangerous. So all these experts want to pretend like he hasn't lost a step. Unequivocally, he has. It's obvious. But has he lost enough of a step? And I'm curious what another offseason will do to his wear and tear and how much more of a step back he's going to take next year. Um, and will it be sufficient enough for us to go, oh, wow, Tom Brady's done? I don't think it's going to be a Peyton Manning situation, but we'll see. Maybe a Joe Montana no, but situation. Here's, but here's, here's something for you to consider. And I heard this uh, with Peter King this afternoon on, on the radio. They're going to draft their heir apparent this year. Huh. So that's why I believe that Tom Brady is around for at least two more years. 
I've also heard the name Tyler Murray as their first round pick. Interesting. Well, we'll see. Well, that's a wrap. Super Bowl 53 is set. It's the Rams and Patriots. You didn't really think we were going to do a preview of that game yet, did you? Heck no. Horns up. Ram it. Go Rams!